Well, uh, good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to another edition of North Country Live. Um, I am Chris Knight. I'm the communications director here at North Country Community College. And I uh, just want to talk a little bit about North Country Live before we start our program tonight. Uh, those of you that have been with us in the past, I apologize if you've heard this, my, my introduction before, um, but I do want to sort of mention some things uh, about the program for those that are um, new to the session. So North Country Live is something that the college launched back in March. Well, we launched it in March of 2020 last year. Our first series was uh, into the spring, a little bit later into the spring. Um, but it was something that we launched at the outset of the COVID pandemic um, as part of an effort to continue community conversations, can continue to uh, provide programs that enrich our communities and um, spark a dialogue in our communities about different topics. So um, we've had uh, probably close to 30, 32 programs so far on a lot of different topics, uh, the environment, wellness, uh, the great outdoors. We've had a bunch of different history programs. And this fall series is, is um, uh, focused on arts and music. And we've had sessions on photography and pottery so far. And coming up, as I mentioned, we'll be talking, uh, we'll be phasing into the music portion of the series with some interesting programs um, to come later this month and into early November. Um, the fall semester programs is sponsored by the North Country Community College Foundation. I'll talk a little bit more about them at the end of the program. Um, and this evening, we're excited to welcome our uh, co-hosts and our panelists for uh, making money in the graphic arts. It is possible. Um, that was a, kind of a catchy phrase. We thought we'd grab a few people in with um, through this program, and I hope it um, it sparks an interest for you. So let me first introduce um, the folks that will be co-hosting with me tonight and helping ask a few questions. Uh, Tina Lamore is the chair of our art department here at North Country Community College. Hi, Tina. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Tina. Uh, also joining us is uh, Elaine Taylor Wild. Elaine is a member of the art department faculty here at North Country. Hi, Elaine. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. And our guests tonight, uh, I'll introduce them each and talk, just talk a little bit about them and have them, once we get to their turn, say a little bit more about their backgrounds. But um, first, Dan Cash, who's uh, joining us from uh, Lake Placid tonight. Dan started as a freelance designer back in 2009. Uh, since then, he's worked with small nonprofit startups, international sporting events, municipalities, and everything in between. He enjoys finding and working with clients who are passionate about their projects. He currently works full-time uh, with the Regional Office of Sustainable Tourism as the senior designer. He works on uh, branding projects, uh, UI, UX development, print publications, and print and digital ad design. Uh, Dan's originally from Georgia. As I mentioned, he lives in Lake Placid with his wife and three kids and a dog too, I believe. Right, Dan? Yeah, he might be back here at some point. So we'll listen. For the it out. Thanks for being here with Dan. Glad to Thank have you. you. Thanks for having me. Yep. Uh, David Monette is with us tonight. David, are you with us uh, from Plattsburgh? Am I right? Yes. Excellent. David's uh, a science fiction and fantasy illustrator and author of the horror urban fantasy novel, The Zombie Axiom. I want to learn a little bit more about that. That was the first book of a three-part series. And his artwork specializes in dragons, the undead, fairies, zombies, all of the fantasy and science fiction themes. He's done numerous paintings also for the uh, role-playing, gaming, hobby industry, as well as the children's book market. And David is currently the uh, museum gallery director for the Strand Center for the Arts in Plattsburgh. And as uh, we talked about a little bit earlier, if you were with us, he's also an adjunct instructor at North Country. David, thanks for being here. Hey, thank you for having me. And then uh, Ren Davidson Seward is uh, joining us tonight too from uh, down the hill here in Saranac Lake. Am I right? Are you at Lake Flower Landing tonight, Ren? Yes. Excellent. Um, Ren uh, was born in 1954 in suburban Chicago into a family of professional artists and designers. She's a 1981 graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, she was the principal at Davidson Design Incorporated, a graphic design studio that specialized in exhibition catalogs and books for over 30 years. Her studios were in New York City and in Saranac Lake. She published artist books under her own uh, imprimatur, is it Pont Le Vieux Press? 
Yes, it was, yeah. She was the Director of Licensing and Product Development at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, she was also a founding board member of Land Escapes, an artist residency that facilitated dialogue between artists and scientists for 10 summers on Mount Desert Island in Maine. Um, she served on the boards of, help me out here, Dieu Donne Paper Mill? Dieu Donne, yeah. Dieu Donne Paper Mill in New York City and Blue Seed Studios in Saranac Lake. And her ongoing professional development includes artist and writing residencies at Provincetown's Fine Art Works Center and with Blue Seed Studios in Mazatlan, Mexico. Uh, graphic design conferences with AIGA and workshops with Edward Tuft, her design guru. Am I pronouncing that right? Tufty. Yeah. Tufty. 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 Yeah. Tufty. Excellent. And um, also, we mentioned this earlier, but uh, Ren has uh, be also been involved in large scale installations in uh, 1920. She was invited, or sorry, in 2020, she was invited to install her memorial field for Black Lives at the John Brown State Historic Site in Lake Placid. That is still there at, as we speak and you can check it out. Um, her innate process drives open-ended narratives that reflect on the upheavals, injustices and undercurrents in the world at large. Wren's trained eye developed around profound interests in visual culture, world travel, art and nature. And uh, she lives in Saranac Lake with her artist husband, Peter Seward in a refurbished 1920s mixed use gallery studio storefront aka Lake Flower Landing. Um, she's the author also of a monograph on her uncle, who's the portrait painter, James J. Ingwersen. Am I getting that one right? You right? got it right, yeah. Cool, well, welcome, thanks for being here. I'm happy to be here, thanks. So I wanna start uh, just by asking you uh, each a little bit about your backgrounds um, to kind of learn how you know that spark um, got lit for each of you, for lack of a better word. So Dan, let me sort of go in order by how I introduce you and ask you that first in, you know, how did the sort of spark for what you're doing now or what's been your passion grow? What was the, you know, was the, you know, sort of starting point for you, would you say? Uh, for me, it really started, uh, <clears throat> I mean, art was always kind of a thing that I did. Uh, it was, you know, it's when you're a kid, the thing that you do and somebody says, wow, you're really good at that. Then that becomes your identity, you know, uh, you're like I'm going to do this. Uh, but really it was, uh, uh, started in high school. I had a teacher by the name of Mr. Aiken, who really was, you know, kind of foundational and, and laying out the con, not just the technique and the skill of art, but also the concepts behind it. And then later in, uh, you know, after college, uh, they're just, started to be needs for, oh, we need, you know, this thing done. And I was like, well, that looks terrible. And, you know, then like, well, you do better. And so I started working on things and applying what I knew from my art background into design. And, and you know, it just kind of grew from there. And, and really it, it, I had always struggled in the arts because I'm not a very expressive person. <laughs> so when people would be like, oh, you know, like art is supposed to express something and you're supposed to express yourself. And, you know, I was told these things over and over again. And I just was not able to do it. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't create like that. Uh, but it was, you know, taking the logic and the application and the practicality of graphic design. And I was like, ah, I can do this. Like I can apply my creativeness into this, into these structures and, and create things this way. Uh, whereas, you know, like a blank page kind of terrifies me, but once you, you lay out structure around that blank page, then, you know, it's, then I can, I can really attach that. So that's kind of how it started for me was definitely in a, and not a, it wasn't like a, a, a thing that I set out to do. Um, but it was just something that I, I just kept finding myself doing. Uh, and then, you know, I took the very long road to making it a, a career. So. And I, I, I uh, I want to ask this next question, and as I'm doing it, I'm going to um, post a link to a website that's got some of your work on it for people to um, check out as um, as we're talking, um, and I'll, I'll do the same for other guests tonight, too. But just, um, I, I talked about it in your bio a little bit there, but tell me about some of the things that you've worked on, some of the things that, um, you know, you've really kind of enjoyed working on, or, you know, you've been the most proud of over the years uh, that, you know, the things that really kind of uh, would you would say, you know, how would you say have been your bread and butter, so to speak, over the years? Yeah, 
So uh, logo, logo design, visual identity design is really what I've been specialized in uh, for the most part, especially in my freelance career. Um, you know, with working as an in-house designer, you wear all the hats, you know, so if someone's like, well, we need a print design. Then you're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be a print designer now. And then they're like, we need digital stuff. And you're like, great. I'm a digital designer now. <laughs> we need motion graphics for a video. And you're like, I'll figure that out too. And we'll do it. You know? So it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of things that happen as an in-house designer. Um, but, you know, for the most part, logo, logo design and brand identity is, is kind of what I uh, specialize in. And that's what mostly my portfolio is. Um, you know, some of the bigger brands that I've worked on, uh, it, if you're familiar with the Empire State Winter Games, uh, we did that one. And that's uh, kind of a funny story. I was given four days to rebrand that entire event um because they were like hey we want we're thinking about doing this next year and I was like cool that's yeah maybe there's some good ideas and then the next day they said great we're going to show everybody what you're, you're doing um on Tuesday and I was like oh all right so that that logo concept all came out in like four frantic days of very sleepless nights so that's that was a you know a pretty big project that I worked on uh, and then lately, uh, I've been making most of my time uh, making animal posters. If you've seen the Politely Adirondack campaign that we did, uh, the animals telling you to put on a mask and wash your hands and stuff, that was uh, that was me. Uh, we did that over at Roost. And uh, so now I, I might be in danger of making animals for the rest of my life because it just seems like this keeps on going. So, uh, you know, the animals will be recommending whatever the CDC says. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, but that was a, that you're was a campaign. Cast now, Dan, you're typecast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, luckily it's pretty easy. You just move shapes around, uh, which I guess is my job, but um, <laughs> yeah. So, and, but to see that project and that campaign be effective and be embraced and uh, you know, uh, I've seen, I've been sent pictures from Syracuse uh, of people seeing my posters that got downloaded and printed up in hospitals. Uh, somebody saw one at a rest stop in New Hampshire uh, and then there was one, I think, in Virginia somewhere, just randomly somebody pulled over on the side of the road and some store was using it in their window. So, yeah, it's kind of crazy uh, the reach that that campaign has had, but um, I'm glad that it was effective. Cool. Let, let me ask David kind of the same question, David. I mean, what was the spark for you um, going back, you know, in the day or however long it was that um, led you to kind of uh, pursue some of the passions that you you've pursued over the years um well for me, or for me it was a little different it happened a little bit uh later on not not high school i was never a really a good high school student um but i uh i managed to get to a, a two-year college and um i had a uh, i had a professor there and uh, i college was for me transformational because i was able to take classes that i really liked and, uh, you know, our classes were that, you know, I, I, I could take our classes in high school, but that wasn't the thrust of the, the, uh, the learning. Um, but when I got to, when I got to college, I was able to take, like, I could just take art classes and, uh, I, I developed by doing that, I developed a, a love for learning, I guess you could say, and, uh, taking an illustration class at, at uh, Mohawk Valley community college, I uh, had a, I had a professor. We, I was looking at one of the, the art books that I have, fantasy science fiction art book, and uh, I showed it to him. And he's like, you know, you, you, you're just as good as any of these guys. You could do this. And uh, that's just like in my head. I was like, oh, my God, you know, I, I can do this. Um, so I gave it a shot. I, I, I went to uh, Syracuse and, you know, got my bachelor's degree there. And after that, I just started, uh, well, back back then you, you would send out postcards <laughs> there was no there's no email there's no, no, nothing like that so you'd send I, you'd send out postcards to art directors and uh you know you you'd get big thick books on on art directors and and companies that that you know might might use your artwork uh so i just i did that i sent out uh i sent out tons of postcards and and i got my first job and just kept doing that uh and i did that for I don't even want to say how long I did it for a while. And, uh, then, uh, you know, my, my wife and I were discussing having children. So I was like, well, you know what I've always like loved doing is, uh, I love talking about my artwork. 
Um, I love bringing my, my portfolios to uh, high schools and taught students because I never had that when I was a student. It was something that uh, was, was uh, you know, something that I think was missing. If I would have known that I could have been an illustrator, if I, you know, if I had that avenue open to me, then uh, maybe I would have, you know, maybe the, the spark would have come earlier. I don't know. But, uh, um, you know, I, I thought, well, maybe I'll just go back to school and, and get my master's degree so all that I can teach. Um, and so that's what I did. And again, while I was in college, uh, my mentor, uh, Murray Tinkleman, he, uh, was looking at my, my, uh, my written work that I was doing for, uh, for my, you know, for my courses. And, uh, he's like, you know, you're, I've been doing this for 35 years and you're one of the best, uh, authors I've, I've seen one of the best writers. And again, <laughs> I was like, wow. And he said, you know, what you should do is you should write a book and you should do, um, the illustrations for it. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do that. So, uh, I just did it. And, um, I wrote, uh, I wrote my first, uh, novel and, um, you know, I had no idea what I was doing with it. I didn't know if I was good at it or not. Um, I sent it out to a bunch of agents and got turned down. So I said, ah, I'll just self-publish it. So I did that. And, um, you know, after, after, self-publishing it maybe it was three months after it was self-published i had a, a publishing company call me and they bought all, all three novels which to me it was huge you know i was like oh my goodness this means that i'm not bad at this <laughs> so um so from then on out I've, I've been you know trying to create my own independent properties basically um i want to write books and illustrate them and you know follow follow that route rather than doing illustrations for other people's books and things like that so that's pretty much it. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. If there's one thing I've sort of picked up on since we started this series is that the importance of uh, teachers along the way, you know, oh, totally. was at the college level for you or, you know, maybe Dan in high school and others. You know, when we talked to folks in photography, our session a couple of weeks ago, they said, you know, there was just sort of that one person that kind of saw something in them and kind of kept pushing, which was pushing them, which was a real spark. Let me, yeah, let me ask Ren um, that same sort of question. I, maybe it's not, maybe my theory is not going to prove true. I don't know. But what was the spark for you, you know, so many years ago that um, you knew this was um, something you wanted to pursue as a, as a career? And you had a lot of different phases to your career. So it's hard to kind of bottle it up into one thing. But what, what was the spark way back when for you? I started really young. I was lucky. My grandfather was an art director for J. Walter Thompson in Chicago. And my dad was in magazine publishing after he was a professional singer for a while in a barbershop quartet. And then he was a salesman for Kraft Foods and he did the promotion and he would hang these really big posters of caramels and, and Velveeta cheese and all these things. Then we would have stuff, all these graphics at home. And then he got into magazine publishing in women's publishing and he took Take Your Daughter to Work uh, days seriously. And so from a young age, I got taken to work um, one, once a year. And they were these days that I always looked forward to. And I got to go on press with a web press and see a magazine made, you know, from like a huge roll of paper. And then you'd walk along the press for like a mile and it would end up a stapled addressed magazine, you know? And so the um, magic of, of production really captivated me as a kid. And then in high school, I was the editor of the yearbook. And, you know, I ended up finding that that was my happy place was putting images and text together in a book. And I went to school, I started in liberal arts school, and I had a sort of, you know, long, crazy nine years before I graduated from RISD and traveled and, you know, um, did a lot of things. But then I had a series of jobs out of school that really helped me with production. So my expertise really started with production. So by the time I went freelance, um, I had uh, 
confidence that I could uh, provide my clients with excellence and that my job as a freelancer was to really bring the kind of um, you know, standards that I learned working at Revlon and working in different corporate cultures, um, that I could bring that to small companies, nonprofits. And so I, you know, prided myself on sort of being an advocate for my clients to get the best possible uh, graphic communications they could have even on a small budget. And so my clients for, I started working exclusively for galleries and museums because I wanted to do art catalogs. That's what I wanted to do. And then when the art market fell apart in the 90s in New York City, I segued into working for nonprofits and ended up really feeling my um, my graphic design work was my advocacy work, and I was doing things in prison reform and middle school reform and tropical disease research and all these different kinds of women's issues, all these different kinds of things that mattered to me. And I was really bringing um, professional level communication. You know, I was bringing everything I could to the table. And uh, so then... I went on to work with publishers and do coffee table books. And I don't know, I've had a lot of fun as a graphic designer. I've really enjoyed my work. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm posting a, a link to your LinkedIn page and we put some links to everyone else's um, sites in there too, for folks that want to you know, take a look while we're, we're talking. Um, one thing I've sort of, it seems like a common de denominator among you all is sort of this, whether it's self-publishing or freelancing or kind of, you know, doing it on your own, there seems to be a certain element of like, you've got to, maybe this is part of the like advice for, you know, people that want to get into this field out there, but like, you've got to take the initiative on your own to get sort of where you want to be in this field. Am I right or wrong there in any way? And anybody can take that question or ignore it if you'd like. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's no, uh, you know, you, the, the worst, the, the, the harshest critic is yourself, I guess, <laughs> you know, there's, there's nobody that's gonna, there, there's going to be people out there that are going to say, you know, you, you should, you should, you know, stop doing this and, and get a, get a normal job. Uh, a normal job, like a nine to five type job. There's gonna be tons of people that say that. Um, you'll start listening to at some point. You'll say, oh, maybe I should. And you'll doubt yourself. You'll damn it, uh, uh, indecision. Um, uh, but you can't listen to it. You just have to, you know, stay focused with, with, uh, with the vision you have of yourself, I guess. And, uh, and, and not listen to any other, more arbitrary things or negative things. Mm -hmm. Another thing I, you know, you can do is make yourself a business card, like really believe in yourself, create this idea of what it is you want to do and promote yourself and, and just put yourself out there as, um, yeah, I'm a graphic designer. Yeah, I know all the creative suites. I'm, yeah, I, yeah, like, like Dan was saying, you know, oh, yeah, I can do that. You know, put it in your portfolio. You know, you know, you've got to, you've got to start somewhere. And I just think promoting yourself, you have to figure out what you, what you want to be and what you want to put, how you might put yourself out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I think the creative field is so unique in that there's not a whole lot of linear career pathways. You know, there's so many, especially now, there's so many disciplines and so many, you know, places you can specialize in things that, you know, it, I, I think it, it can be tough and it's easy to just kind of peter out or reach, you know, like a top you know, of, of some spot and then not know where to go next. Um, I, for me personally, I didn't go to school for graphic design. I wish I had, 
I always tell people if they ask like, well, should I go to school for design? I'm like, if you want to be a designer, you should absolutely go to school for design because you'll spend the next four or more years making all the mistakes and learning everything the hard way. Um, but, you know, one of the things that you were talking about, like the, the kind of grind is, you know, it's ever evolving. And so even after you graduate with a degree, you know, that, that got you out the door with a degree and maybe it gets you in the door somewhere, but you have to constantly be studying and looking at trends and looking at new programs and no, new skills and new designs and new te uh, techniques. Uh, Cause you know, like what, what, you know, when I started in 2009, thankfully I'm not designing the same way because that would be awful. Um, you know, that, that style is, you know, a lot of those things just kind of are no more. So you have to constantly be kind of, especially if you're a, a, a designer, you constantly have to be evolving your, your style and, and to fit the, the needs of the client or the needs of the project or whatever it is. Uh, I mean, and that's, that's one of the things I love about it is, you know, it's like every new project is a, is a chance to almost reinvent yourself or, or to like add something to your, your toolbox. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating career to, uh, to have you know, if you can get, get it. <laughs> you talk about 2009, like it was so long ago, Dan, to me, it was just like yesterday. <laughs> You're making me feel old here. It's, you know, I don't know about how the other two feel here on the panel, but looking back two years in my portfolio, is sometimes terrifying. Uh, you know, like, I, I mean, sometimes you look back at the design you're working on, you're like, oh, what was I thinking? <laughs> so sometimes it's good to, you know, it's, it's tough sometimes. Uh, yeah, the, the life, the life cycle of a design is is very short sometimes. Sure. And I was going to go ahead, David. I was just going to tell Dan that he's his own worst critic, or I think we all are in the, you know, we have a tendency to be that way. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I was just working on a project and uh, it's coming up to the first round of revisions and had like seven different style logos that I was working on. And I was pulling my hair out and just couldn't, I couldn't land the plane, you know, like I was just going through and I was like, I was close to just, I was like, I want to delete everything. I want to delete everything and start over again. And my wife was like, go somewhere else outside of your office and just, you know, just think, and then, you know, come back to it. And sure enough, you know, she was right. I was able to pull it, you know, and they loved every, every option. So it was, you know, it was nice, but I was definitely at that point in the project where I was like, I hate me. I hate myself. I hate these designs. <laughs> I hate illustrator. <laughs> Yeah. I just want to say, since Dan, you worked for us for many years, you were the best graphic artist I've ever seen. You you just captured it, and you, you from the fonts to the graphics, you you did a terrific job. And yeah, you're very um, modest. <laughs> you're Let me so just quickly Thank introduce you, that's Kathy Moore, <laughs> the publisher retired of the Adirondack Daily Enterprise and the North Country Community College uh, graduate <laughs> in graphic arts or art back in the day, right, Kathy? Yes, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And at least now I'm retired and I'm painting again. So uh, I just wanna get my creative juices going again. So I thought I'd just watch uh, behind the, the curtain here. Well, as I drink free. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. That was very nice of you to say. No, you We've got a small group here, so if others want to jump in and ask some questions, feel free to. You can kind of wave to me. Or... Go ahead, Elaine. I, yeah, I have a question. Um, what, looking back on on your careers, um, which you know, I'm not saying you're like dead and gone, <laughs> you know, but uh, looking back, what would be something that you're most proud of that that just you were like yeah okay I nailed that one um I'm really proud of anybody want to take that Go ahead. um for, for me it was uh for me it was uh getting a uh getting a book agent I was just you know that's like the the gatekeeper to the publishing to put getting your book published and uh um that was just another, that was like the, the gratification with that, with knowing that I wasn't, that, that all the work that I put into writing was, wasn't, wasn't uh, wasted, you know, cause it's a hard, it's a hard thing. Cause you're like, you know, you, you, it, it, when it's something new, I think uh, Dan had hit on this too before, 
Like if it's, if it's something new and you're just like, yeah, I'll do that. And uh, <laughs> I'll write a book. So you spend all this time doing it. And uh, it's like um, to have, to have somebody in the, in a, like a professional person look at it and say, you know, this is, this is good. I can do something with this um, was, was tremendously gratifying for me. So that's mine. It's mine. And, and I think about Dan Cash there, um, those signs with the animals and everything. That I think is so important, at least when I was in advertising, just to, to, to be seen and people to um, take action and notice your ad and the design. Um, I think that's a success because you're changing people's businesses or their minds or you're, you're making an impact and you're making an impression. So I think that's, that's important. You're making a difference. So people say, oh, it's just, you're just selling or laying out ads. And it's more than that. You're, you're really changing people. Uh, like you're getting a message out, you know, you're kind of, you have a story to tell visually, right? Ren, let me throw you that, that same question that Elaine asked, what sort of proud moment over the years or when things just kind of lined up perfectly for you? I was uh, a member of the Association of Independent Graphic Artists for many years, and they had an annual competition called 50 Books, 50 Covers. And one of the books I designed won one year, and that was really a highlight for me professionally to be recognized by my peers like that. And the book was part of a 10 part series on shamans and healers around the world. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was sort of a outside the box. It wasn't a traditional book the way I designed it. Anyway, that was a professional coup. That was good. That was great. And, you know, I think collaborating with people uh, other professionals has been the highlight of my career, that when you get the synergy in the room of a bunch of creatives sitting around a table and you're brainstorming and um, people are bringing their own set of skills to the table, wonderful things happen. And, you know, just collaborating with clients who have an open mind and are willing to um, have, you know, to change their mind about what it is they need and what it is they want. Like they'll, they'll come to you with a problem, but then if you all brainstorm together, you can change it around and make it into something much more exciting and much better and much, you know, that communicates on a, a different level. So um, yeah, I appreciate the clients that I've had, and I've had a lot, a lot of fun working with them. So collaboration, I'd say, is the highlight of my career. Can I ask what that, what was the 10 part book series or the one that you won the, the, the award for? It was called Profiles of Healing. Profiles and, it of was, healing. Okay. and it was published by Ringing Rocks Press, a small press out of Philadelphia, where there are in fact rocks that ring. And um, it's all part of the shamanistic, uh, you know, aura of this project, but it was uh, 10 books on 10 healers around the world. And, you know, the editor, the author of the series, Brad Keeney, um, was like the luckiest man on earth who got paid to go around the world and work with healers and be indoctrinated into all these different cultures. And so these books, um, you know, the budget wasn't the priority you know, making them beautiful. They had CDs, they had slip cases. It was really lavish productions. And, and it was, you know, super fun to make these books. That's cool. So. Dan, you had talked earlier about some of your highlights. Did, um, I don't know whether there was anything else that you, I don't want to omit you, but uh, unless you felt like you answered that question earlier about sort of proud moments and things you've worked on. And I think so. Um... You know, I, in my position at Roost, um, I mean, number one, I think becoming a de the designer at Roost um, was validating for me uh, as someone who didn't hold a design degree and was kind of uh, a very scrappy graphic designer that didn't have a lot of, I mean, one of the things you get when you go to a design school is you get a lot of connections in the creative world. 
uh, and not having any of those connections, it was very difficult to kind of find a way in. Um, and I wish what is available now online was available then because I think it would have been a lot easier, but this is like, you know, uh, almost before Facebook was even widely uh, utilized. So it was very difficult to, and, and isolating. I think at the time I was in Watertown, you know, New York. So, you know, it's not a, not a real hotbed of graphic design of the graphic design world, you know? So, um, but, you know, becoming a, like a, a professional designer was, was validating because, you know, it was like that I can, I could honestly say like, yes, I'm a graphic designer. That's what I do. That's how I pay my bills. And, uh, and then I would say too, um, kind of along the lines of what Ren was saying is working with other designers and other, uh, you know, whether it was workshop or, um, you know, some of the other design firms that we got to work with, with Roost, you know, it was fun to work with other designers. And um, even when I became the senior designer, because we brought on a junior designer here at Roost, she was just out of college. And so mentoring her and kind of, you know, helping her along in her career and with her technique, like that's been very rewarding for me as well is to, is to see somebody grow uh, like that as a designer. So that was pretty fun. Still is fun. She's still there. <laughs> I didn't run her off. <laughs> I did want to ask you each, since we're in the, you know, Adirondacks in the North Country, and someone hinted at this, I think, earlier, as, is it more difficult here or easier here to sort of find your path? I mean, I, mean, I know, Ren, you kind of, you came here, right? You weren't from here originally, but you eventually found, you know, a place here as well, in addition to your career elsewhere in the city and so on. And but I guess my question is more, you know, are there specific challenges maybe as a graphic designer, graphic artist, illustrator that you might face here in the Adirondacks trying to make that a career path that you wouldn't face, obviously, somewhere else? Obviously, in the big city, it's going to be a little different, but but maybe it's easier here to get a foothold in and then move elsewhere. I don't know. Anybody want to try and bring some semblance from that question. Go ahead, David. Um, for me, I've always said it doesn't matter where I live as long as there's FedEx. Uh, <laughs> so back, back when I was uh, doing actual oil paintings, um, you know, FedEx, I could send them out, overnight them, and the art directors get them now. It's all digital. So um, as long as there's that, it doesn't matter. For me, I used to live down by New York for a few years. And it's easier now here because I have family and friends who are cheap models that I can, <laughs> so I can, I can, I can get them to, to pose for me for, for anything. And, um, you know, I don't have to worry about paying them. So that's my thing. At uh, least beer and pizza. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is a little difficult in that it's a small market. Um, the cool thing about being in the Adirondacks is that I think a lot of business owners, especially di maybe different than like when I lived in Watertown, a lot of business owners understand the value of appearance and their brand and they want it to look good. They want it to be attractive to the person walking down the street. So a lot of business owners understand that. So working as a freelancer, you know, that's, they kind of understand the importance of what you do. Um, but, you know, the budgets are smaller, the projects are oftentimes smaller, you know, you have to take into consideration that they're not going to be paying for spot colors and Pantone matching uh, on their print projects. They're going to send this to uh, moo.com or, you know, uh, you, the UPS store or something. And, you know, it's, and it's going to be, it has to be, it has to be a, a brand that they can work with and, and work with easily. Um, and so it's hard to kind of branch out outside of the area because, you know, we are kind of like closer up here, but they're also a lot of fun to work with. So there's, you know, there's trade offs The you know, it's uh, but it is also kind of fun in a small town when you do a lot of work and then you're like walking around. And you're like, I did that. Oh, look, I did that. <laughs> like when I go into Saranac Lake or Tupper Lake and, you know, there's stuff on the pole banners and stuff. I can be like, hey, that's my logo. Look at that. So that's kind of fun. So in a small town, it's, it's kind of neat to see the impact of, of your work. Um, but yeah, there's definitely challenges, but mm -hmm. there's also less competition. There's not a lot of us up here that are doing graphic design at a, at a high level. 
So, you know, if you were in New York City, you're competing against, you know, arguably the, some of the best designers in the world. So, you know, while the small market has its challenges, it's also kind of nice. <laughs> so, yeah. That's cool. Um, I, I did want to ask, you know, we're talking about creativity here and if, uh, any artist, any designer, illustrator might have those moments of block, you know, that creative block kind of comes in where you've got this project, you're, you've got a deadline or you're, it's a self-imposed deadline. Um, and it's just not, it's just not happening. That creativity kind of is stalling for you. How, how have you each, have you each experienced that? I'm going to say maybe you have, uh, uh, but maybe not. Um, and how do you get out of it? You know, what, what have, what have you found? Ooh, well, Go ahead, Ren. I'll, I'll say that I don't know if my creativity has gotten blocked as much as just as a freelancer, all of a sudden I don't have any work. And so, you know, then it, it's like, oh no, the phone is not ringing. What do I do? You know, because I was so dependent on word of mouth, getting jobs, word of mouth. And one thing led to another, I was very spoiled, and, but then I would go through these periods. And so I think as a freelancer, you know, just, you know, getting used to, hey, you've got to work hard when there's work, you've got to take it on, you do it. And then all of a sudden there's nothing. And then you have to like somehow cope with not working and enjoying yourself so that I think as a freelancer to figure out how to enjoy the times when you have a lot of work and amortize everything on, get it, you know, to, so you can pay the bills all the time, but you don't have to work all the time because that is the real um, joy of being a freelancer is not, is having some downtime. And so, yeah, I think when all of a sudden the phone stopped ringing, those were my most challenging times. And then to figure out how to kickstart uh, my work again. Uh, and there were some rough patches. There were some rough patches along the way. Yeah. Anybody else have those, those challenges or those moments where you're trying to find the next paycheck? Go ahead, David. Uh, for me, uh, if I, when I run into a block, I just, um, I just stay up later. <laughs> <laughs> or or just yeah basically you just keep working at it because it's going to come you just have to have confidence in yourself and and just keep okay this this sketch isn't working i just have to go to another one and another one and i when i teach i tell my students um you know you have to do a minimum of 12 thumbnails they're little sketches that you do um before you go to a to a uh, what's called a rough um which is a, a more detailed drawing and it's the it's that thumbnail stage where you're trying to come up with the composition and that's when things get tough once you once you've established your composition the rest of it's easy um but it's just getting that initial composition to work properly um so i just do more thumbnails um and then just just keep working and stay up later and just make it work that's it yeah i found changing locations helps you know, just taking my work somewhere else, grabbing the laptop, heading out to Origin Coffee or Nori's or wherever I can find internet and a quiet table and, you know, and caffeine. Um, I would agree with David that caffeine pretty much powers the graphic design world. Um, if they ever outlaw it, we're just, the whole industry's doomed. <laughs> but, you know, uh, <laughs> it, for, me, for me, like just the way my mind works, sometimes just uh, either like, switching projects um, or, you know, switching out. So, yeah, I keep my guitar behind me. So maybe playing guitar a little bit badly uh, will help and, you know, to kind of unlock stuff. And then, you know, there's another advantage of living in the Adirondacks is, you know, stepping outside is pretty inspirational. Uh, so that kind of helps. Definitely. Good. Elaine, um, 
Does working, I mean, you just mentioned, you know, playing music, does working in another medium, do you ever say pick up a camera and go take some photographs or, uh, you know, do an oil painting instead of working in Illustrator, et cetera, do an installation? Does that, does that kind of help unblock? Uh, well, for me, I'm not very good at any of those things. So I don't know if that, would, that really help. <laughs> I'm a terrible... Worse. I'm a terrible painter. I really wish digital uh, painting had come along sooner because uh, when I first tried painting, it just got so expensive to be terrible because, you know, you're blowing through supplies and canvases and oils and you're like, well, this, this is not sustainable, <laughs> but you know, so for me, it's uh, I think mostly just a change in like to, to put my brain on standby and kind of like, let it, let it process stuff in the subconscious for a bit and then to try to reattack it. But I wish I was better at all those things, but may maybe some someday I'll work on that. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need to take a class. We can help with that down here at North Country Community College. Well, I also feel like inspiration comes from all sorts of places. And any, you know, if I go to the movies and for print, you know, you're looking at the credits and how they, you know, do the titles and, you know, whether you're in the grocery store and you're looking at labels on food or, you know, whatever it is. I mean, graphics are everywhere. And so to just always be trolling for how things are being represented and, you know, I'm just always, it's visual culture. I mean, once you're, once it is your medium, it's everywhere and you can find it. So I guess we're just, I'm always looking and I'm always interested in what new designs are coming up and, and um, inspired by things. I was just on a Zoom before this and it was a new book called The Prison in the Woods. And the cover is so beautiful on that book. And I just, you know, oh, I wish I did that cover, you know, uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> so. Rin, do you ever like to go to uh, like antique shops and stuff? As, as for me, I really love like old machinery and like the labels and stuff they used to put on, you know, like the bolt on metal labels and all the design of the typography and stuff on like old signage. Like I can, I can geek out in an antique store for a long time. Well, I pulled a book off the shelf recently that I have saved. I mean, the cover is not even attached anymore and it's just all special borders you know, they're like 19th century book and it's all these little borders. I've had, I've had that book forever. And, you know, yeah, I, I love, yeah, I find inspiration in all sorts of places. So. That's cool. Um, I wanted to ask you all, since let's, let's get this question out of the way before we get kind of end on a brighter note, but, you know, as, artists have you had to deal with you know negative feedback on your work at times and you know if I'm a young artist trying to get started and you know somebody gives me some negative feedback you know for a lot of people that could be kind of a, a real point in your life where you're like am I what am I doing am I you know am I doing what what I should be doing or how you know have you had experiences like that of someone giving you some negative feedback on your work and how you kind of get past that. Go ahead, David. Um, I've got a, I've got a, a crate of thanks for your interest, but no thanks. <laughs> I mean, it, after the first 50, your, your skin should be thick, you know? Um, you, it's, it starts in it's for me it started in college when you you my first critique uh you have to learn how to you have to learn how to take criticism of your work uh if you, if you don't then you're going to be a very angry person um i always tell my students listen uh if somebody comes up to you and says uh you know says this this work is crap this is terrible um and it's your work you have a right to tell them to you know take off yeah, I didn't ask for your opinion, but uh, if it's a professor, a teacher, an art director, and they give you their opinion, you have to take it. And if you ask for somebody's opinion, you have to take it. Um, so the, you have to build a thick skin. <laughs> There's no two ways about it. Uh, 
and you just have to learn to to nod your head and uh, accept criticism. Otherwise, you're going to be you're going to be doomed, <laughs> absolutely doomed. And uh, there's no I don't know what it's like for the for the, the other two folks, but uh, that's how it is for me. Uh, you know, learning to take negative comments about your work is just part of being an artist. You know, as soon as you make something creative, somebody's going to come along, come along and you know pour uh, you know oil all over it. You know, and just say it's no good. Uh, so just get used to it. I'll second that motion. Art school, the best thing about art school was critiques. Because you do get a thick skin, you just learn that there's constructive criticism and you take from it what means something to you. And you have to, you have to separate your ego from what people say because it's subjective. And you have to learn that, uh, like Dan, you're going to be your harshest, your own harshest critic, really. Um, but, but critiques in art school were fabulous for toughening up that skin, letting it roll off your back. You know, and my feeling is ideas are a dime a dozen. You know, you take what's good, you throw out the rest. You know, you put things on the table, you, you talk about it honestly and everybody has their opinion and and you don't take it personally period yeah 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 i would uh, yeah i'll third all of that um rejection is kind of part of the game um and especially working in like uh with visual identities you know you're often presenting three options as you know that's like the default you know whatever and and they pick it apart right there in front of you and you have to you know uh, explain or defend you know, without becoming defensive and, you know, explain like why this would be a good option or, or whatever. And, you know, some people are better at expressing their opinions of your work than others. Um, definitely. I've been pooped on a couple of times where it's just, well, that's garbage. You know, and you're like, okay, well, how about option B then? And we'll <laughs> see how you like that one. And you hope that like one of them. Um, I, th I think one of the, the, the hardest parts is when and this is, you know, coming from uh, like working with with various clients, and I won't name names, but um, there have been times where the process has derailed, and what what is left over <laughs> is not something I'm proud of, <laughs> or is even good. Um, but you know, it's what the client ultimately wanted, and you could not, you know, it's one of those you can take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink kind of situations, yeah. and you know you're already locked in and, you know, here we are and the, the end of the ride is coming up fast and there's no brakes. <laughs> and so, you know, you say, all right, well, here's the logo package, all your files, your brand, your style guide, and, um, you know, the terms of payment, payment for the rest of it is two weeks and uh, have a great life. And I'm not going to put this in my portfolio. <laughs> you just kind of, you go on to the next project because the next project comes on and you got to be able to be like, Whew pull it all, you know, and if you're, especially if you're, if things are good and you're working on multiple projects, sometimes it's really hard to go from like a meeting with just rejection and uh, criticism to like, okay, I got to like start over again mentally with this next client and say like, okay, you know, here's some more and that might go well, you know, you, you know, sometimes you can't tell, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's a, it's, uh, that's definitely an experience that I wish I had had uh, earlier on. Again, I always tell people you can make, you can go to art school and learn all these things, or you can learn it the hard way in twice as many years. So, you know, it's neither one of them is free. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. We've, we've got just a couple minutes left. And if anyone, um, you know, wants to throw in a question for our group, feel free to unmute yourself or, uh, or pop it into the chat in the last, uh, last couple minutes that we have here. I don't want to, um, and when I, as a, I'm a former journalist, as a few of you know, and I, I am very guilty of sometimes answering questions for people I'm interviewing instead of letting them answer them. So I kind of, I don't want to do this now, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, but I wanted to kind of close in asking you each to take a minute to just reflect on, okay, you know, I'm at this place now, whether it's what stage of my career I'm in right now, what's the one or two things that 
10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I wish I knew, um, you know, which maybe would have helped me along the way. Something that, you know, for in a couple of the previous sessions, this is my answering my own question part of this. Um, people, our photographers, our, um, you know, pottery artists commented that they wish they had more, had uh, learned more about the business side of things um, earlier that, especially as freelancers, I think, because that was the case for them, that that was something, a skill that they maybe had spent some more time on in the past. Is there anything that comes to mind for each of you when you sort of think back and say, eh, I wish I had done that back then, because now I know that you know, that really would have made a difference to me or would have you know, made things a little bit smoother or easier. Two minute question to ask, to ask it. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Uh, I, well, I would say that business, that business thing is, that would have been nice <laughs> to know alert, earlier on. And I wish I would have developed ways to overcome my own self-confidence issues and imposter syndrome and, and join the creative community earlier. Uh, in my career, instead of trying to go it alone, uh, but mostly out of fear of of being found out as an imposter, uh, which, you know, still obviously a little bit nags you have still, but, uh, you know, it's it's just one of those things that just kind of follows you. So, but I wish I had overcome that a lot earlier because most of the designers I meet are really great. I should have known them earlier. <laughs> I think so from a lot of people that the... Um the the business end of it they, they're very talented and, and uh put out a great product or a great service um but the business end is is the weak link and so if you're especially as a freelancer that that is um very helpful to know yeah you can't be afraid to talk about money with your client right up front i mean that i've coached a lot of people on that you have to like set the terms of the deal really you know, right away, right up front. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and some people who just feel uncomfortable discussing money. Um, you know, I, I have to say the first time I sent a bill to a client and I got a check, I was amazed. I was like, <laughs> wow, they actually paid, you know, and then it gave me confidence to send another bill. But, um, <laughs> you know, that, that I remember that still, but you know, I think as a freelancer, uh, as for all the perks that go along with freelance, um, sometimes I felt like I wasn't part of a larger community. And I felt like uh, I missed out on certain kind of, you know, coffee clutches, or I don't know what, you know, but I just felt like, wow, you know, I was making it up as I was going along. And I, at one point I had seven employees. So I had my own community and I sort of was taking care of them like a family. But um, uh, I don't know. I think sometimes freelance, you feel isolated and you're, you're, you don't have the community that people who work in a larger organization have. Hey, Chris, who teaches graphic arts now at North Country? Tina, you want to take that? Elaine and Tina? Sorry, I didn't hear that. She asked who teaches graphic arts at the college. Uh, myself, Elaine, David at times, hopefully more in the future. Oh, okay, great. So there's like three instructors. Fabulous. Yes. Two while we were going through COVID. Um, so we're hoping that that um, picks back up. But I think one of the things, and I don't know if you, um, that we've seen is that there isn't a lot of support from parents for kids going into even, you know, there's a, <laughs> There's been a business aspect of graphic design and graphic arts um, for a long time, but 
um, as opposed to painting, for instance, like I was told, well, you can't go to college for art because you'll never make any money. And that was a long, long time ago and it still is happening. And um, I think that there have been things that you've addressed that um, would be valuable in a conversation with a student. And I love how you all had some impact in a high school or a college professor. Um, so this has been very exciting to hear. David, I know you were gonna jump in on that one point about what would younger David Monette tell older uh, David Monette right now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, for me, I just wish I would have, I wish I would have had the confidence to start my own independent properties earlier. Um, you know, or to, to, to the, 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 the spur for that came, you know, I, I wish that happened in my twenties, you know, that would have been, that would have been, that would have been better, but, you know, take it as it is, <laughs> you know, it's well, basically and as, and as an adjunct instructor for us, we're grateful that you can pass on that knowledge and you know other everything else you all have mentioned here you know tonight to our students and hopefully when you know we get some folks to um we'll show this uh obviously on our youtube channel and other things and because the, the advice here has been um amazing go ahead tina we have a request in the chat of david asking if oh. you've designed your shirt no and no, this is, uh, this is Radiohead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, that would have been a feather in the cap of your career right there if you were doing Radiohead t-shirts. Yeah, I know. That would have been great. <laughs> That's great. I think the neat, one of the neat things about this conversation was you all have so such different um, sort of fields that you've been a part of when you talk about you know, the graphic arts, but so many common denominators among you, you know, between Dan, what you've been doing for Roos, David, your amazing illustration work and um, your success with your, you know, your books and Ren, your, you know, sort of multi-phase career. I mean, I've learned a lot about each of you, but you've all, you know, you've all got an initiative. You've all shown a real ability to be flexible and pivot you know, when you need to, um, and, you know, stick to your guns too, you know, so some really awesome lessons tonight. So I want to thank you all for, um, for being part of this great discussion tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, David. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Just a reminder that, um, Again, thanks to our panelists here tonight that this program has been recorded and we will be posting it on the college's North Country Live page and also on our YouTube channel. Um, look for it uh, sometime tomorrow um, and feel free to share it among your friends and all your colleagues and uh, your Facebook buddies. Um, we'd be happy to kind of help um, get some of these important messages, get this advice out to folks that might be aspiring graphic artists and uh, folks that are interested in illustration, animation, so many different fields out there. Um, um, and tune in next week. We will be having a really interesting uh, performance by uh, John McDougall. We're calling it Feel the Beat and Find, the, Find Your Rhythm, uh, African Drumming. Um, we're going to get some people moving next week on North Country Live. So same time next week, 7 p.m. Uh, here on Zoom. You can use the same link that you use to log in here tonight. Um, and I want to thank the North Country Community College Foundation for sponsoring um, the program tonight as well. The foundation's the philanthropic arm of the college, and you can find out some more about it on our website uh, at nccc.edu slash foundation. Thanks again, everybody. Appreciate you tuning in. Thanks to our panelists. Thank you. Nice to see you, Kathy. Good night. Bye-bye. Have a good night. <laughs>